Greetings, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Get out your King James Bible. Turn it to the book of Exodus. We're going to take a look at chapter 25. This is a continuation of the Tabernacle in the Wilderness study. A lot of people don't know it, but the uh, tabernacle was in the shape of a cross. And every item in the tabernacle had a specific function pointing towards salvation in Christ in the coming future. I remember when I was... Uh, middle school, I guess you could say, or junior high school, we called it back then. I went to a uh, mostly black school and uh, had a lot of problems. I mean, you know, getting robbed and beat up. So my parents pulled me out, put me in a private school, which was very expensive, by the way. It was Baptist. And I remember a project. I, I, you know, I was young, but I remember this. One of our projects was to build a copy of the tabernacle. And, you know, I don't remember teach any, them teaching any of this stuff that I've been reading lately. Just nothing. You know, it was like just building a model of something and you don't have any idea of what the functions were. Or, you know, maybe I was not paying attention. But... Um, that's when I first started to believe in the Lord, which is why in 1964-65, the uh, so-called Supreme Court of the United States decided to take prayer and Bible reading out of the public schools, where it had been for hundreds of years. A lot of people don't know it, but Harvard and Yale were started as Bible colleges. That's what they were. Now Harvard has a class on anal sex. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. But um, the tabernacle, the Lord built, had that, uh, gave some very, very explicit instructions on how to construct it. I mean, the, the detail is very specific. And... The Lord put his spirit upon those people that were involved in building it so that they would do it properly and honor him in the way that he wished. A lot of people don't know it, but uh, when you come to the Lord, you have to come to him his way on his terms. I mean, that's just how it is. You've got a bunch of churches that teach that, uh, well, what was that uh, Frank Sinatra song, I Did It My Way? That don't cut it. No. You're going to do it his way or not at all. And sadly, that's why we have 666 different versions of churches and Bibles. All right, with that in mind, let's, uh, one other point was that from the time of Israel's exodus out of Egypt, which was the first Passover, and perhaps I'm going to do the, um, the Bible holy days because they also point towards the, the plan of salvation. They really do. I mean, let's face it, the Passover. They took a lamb, they sacrificed it, they took the blood and put it up on the lintel of the doors, on the doorposts. And who was the shed blood of the lamb? Christ, of course. John the Baptist said when he saw Christ, he says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. 
And he wasn't just whistling Dixie either. So, yeah, there's uh, some, you know, people don't bother to read the Old Testament because they think it's not relevant. It's like, I don't know about them, but I see Christ all throughout the Old Testament. I see, I Genesis 3, I see Christ. I mean, where it says that... Uh, where he would bruise the head of the serpent. I mean, come on, people. All right, so Exodus chapter 25. We're not going to read the whole thing because it's a lot of detail. But if you want to read the uh, exact specifications of the building plans, well, it really wasn't a building. It was kind of like a tent-type structure. It was made to be mobile because they were moving in the desert. But in the early days, the Lord himself was their leader, their king. And of the 12 tribes, the tribe of Levi was to serve the Lord in the tabernacle. That was their job. They were the ones that were to burn incense and offer the animal sacrifices and things of that nature. Now, I don't believe that I'm a Levitical priest, and I haven't studied their... Uh, well, let's face it, the Levitical priests were trained from a very, very young age. And they spent a lot of time. The entire book of Leviticus was their training manual I mean, it's applicable in some ways to everybody, but uh, they were the ones that would uh, read the, the law to the people. The law, the statutes, the ordinances. And Moses and Aaron were Levites. They were of the tribe of Levi. So with that in mind, let's read Exodus 25, a few verses. We'll read a few verses here and there. Verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart. Ye shall take my offering. See, now this is the thing. God wanted us to give willingly. Uh and this is the offering which ye shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair. And you can keep reading because it goes into a lot of details. If you want to read about the uh, furniture and the, the uh, tabernacle, we're going to cover more on that later. Uh, I guess we'll read verse 5 to verse 9. And ram skins dyed red, and badger skins, and shittim wood. Oil for the light. Olive oil was indicative of the Holy Spirit, right? Spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense. Onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. Now, we, I did a little thing on the breastplate. Um... Honestly, I, I'm not sure. I know the 12 stones in the breastplate represent the 12 tribes of Israel, but I'm not sure which stones represent which tribe and the meaning of those stones. So if anybody knows, I'd be interested. Verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. What is a sanctuary? A safe place, right? And let them make me, the Lord, a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. So, it gets very, very detailed. 
Now the tabernacle was surrounded by basically like a fence, but it was made of linen, fine linen. And according to the dimensions that I've seen, it was approximately 75 foot wide and 150 foot long and about seven and a half feet high. So you could not, uh, an average person walking by could not look in and see what was going on inside the linen walls or of that tabernacle. And for those of you in Europe, uh, 75 feet is about 23 meters. 150 feet is about 76, uh, 46 meters, 46. And it was about 2.3 meters high. So what were the significance of these numbers? I do not know. Now, there was a single gate or entranceway, I guess you could say, into the tabernacle. Now, I find it interesting that there was only one entrance and what one exit into the tabernacle. One door. What did Jesus say in John 14, verse 6? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In John 10, in verses 1 and 2, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now remember, there's, <laughs> there's only one door. Verse 3, To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. You see, there was only one entrance, you know. If you wanted to go to the tabernacle and climb over the, well, the wall or whatever, it's kind of like a, you know, it's just fine linen. You want to go up some other way? Uh, good luck with that. It ain't going to work out for you if you do. In Revelation 3 and verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now this is Jesus speaking. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. All right, so you had one door, 
one entrance. And the tabernacle was surrounded by fine linen. Is there a New Testament reference to this? Well, how about Revelation chapter 19? Verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Now, obviously, the wife is the church. And let me tell you something. The church is not ready. All these pre-trib rapture people teaching, they're getting ready to fly away any second. They're not ready. They're not, they, they, they're not like silver tried and purified seven times. I mean, I don't think any of us are. I mean, maybe some of you are, but I know I'm not. That's for sure. I got so many things that I'm trying to work out in my life. But the Lord wants a church without spot and blemish. And uh, this garbage passing itself off as a church today? Uh-uh. I ain't going to cut it, dog. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and the wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed, arrayed means clothed, that she should be arrayed in fine linen. Remember, the tabernacle was uh, surrounded by fine linen. Basically, it's like being clothed with fine linen. And those on the inside were covered with fine linen. Those on the outside, not so much. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Ah, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Well, is that righteousness our righteousness, or is that the righteousness of Christ? I hope you know the answer to that. Because uh, there's nothing in my life that uh, is righteous righteousness of saints, I'll tell you that. Verse 9, And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. All right, what about righteousness of saints? How about Genesis chapter 15, verse 1? After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, no children, right? And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. Now, people, let me tell you something. If you've ever been out in the middle of the desert, a hundred miles from any city, and you look up in the sky, there's parts of the sky that are just white with stars. There must be millions of them. I used to study astronomy when I was in... Uh, 
elementary school and uh, I found it very interesting but uh, I was guess I was one of those weird kids but uh, you know the Lord's saying look up in the sky count the stars that's what your children are going to be your descendants are going to be like look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them and he said in him so shall thy seed be and he abram and he believed in the lord and he counted it to him for righteousness you see belief in the lord is counted for our righteousness In Matthew 6:33 Jesus said but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you And Romans 3:22 Oh I'm sorry or 3:21 and 22 but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. See, this is why they hate Paul, those Hebrew roots deceivers. They want you to keep laws so that you can, when you meet the Lord on Judgment Day, you can say, well, pff, hey, Lord, I, I kept your laws. Oh, really? How many did you keep? Well, I kept over 300 of them. Well, there's more than 300, and, and uh, let's see, the soldier's ransom. Did you pay the soldier's ransom? Uh, what's a soldier's ransom, Lord? That's that law that you didn't keep. So, guess what? You're guilty. I think I'd rather have faith in Christ than trying to keep over 300 and something laws. And besides that, even if there was a point in time when you kept them all, what about the point in time before you did kept them all? You can't keep them all. Impossible. You know, when you were a five-year-old and you took a piece of candy out of the candy jar and your, when your mom wasn't looking and when she told you not to. And then she says, did you take a piece of candy out of that candy dar, jar? And, and you said, no. Well, guess what? You broke the law. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. And that's Jesus Christ, not Yeshua HaMashiach. I don't know who Yeshua HaMashiach is. How about Romans 4, 3 and 4, 5? For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for his, uh, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the uh, ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness you see the tabernacle you know the fine linen the one door tell me this doesn't point to Christ it does absolutely all right when you uh, well not us but when the Levitical priest went through the door, the first thing that he would encounter was the brazen altar. And what was the purpose of the brazen altar? Well, that was where the animals were killed, sacrificed, okay, and their blood was put on the horns of the altar. 
If I remember correctly, there were four horns on the altar. I mean, I wonder how many thousands and thousands of animals would have been sacrificed over the centuries. You know? And, uh, you know, there was a spiritual significance to all these animals being killed. I mean, let's face it. These were animals that would have been very useful for food. You know, goats and lambs. You know, but that's what it was. It was a sacrifice. It was man giving something up on the physical plane as an offering to the spiritual plane, I guess you could say. Now, the uh, tabernacle on earth, I am pretty certain that it is the physical representation of something that existed in heaven. But uh, the um, brazen altars where they sacrificed many animals and shed their blood, their blood. But what does the book of Hebrews chapter 9 say in verse 20? Saying, this is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are, by the law, purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. What does that mean? Remission of sins. Have you ever heard of uh, somebody had cancer and then they said it went into remission? It means it went away. But uh, for them, cancer can come back. But when there's remission of sins, they don't come back. Verse 23, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Somebody pointed out to me that the, uh, the, uh, there was a golden candlestick and the fire for the altar of incense was taken from the brazen altar. And they say that uh, it shows that this basically points everybody to know that, uh, you know, Christ being the light of the world, that you must first meet him at the foot of the cross. And that's what the brazen altar represented. And when they sacrificed these animals, they burned them. They burned them, you know, they killed them and burned them. With fire, right? Well, that's usually how you burn stuff, right? I know. I mean, let's face it. You, uh... The brazen altar, what was it about? Blood, burning flesh, death. That's what, uh, that was basically showing everybody that was the consequences of sin. And, you know, we should never... Uh, we should never look at, just overlook sin like it's nothing. And I need to look in the mirror myself. So, yeah. God hates sin today just as much as he did a thousand years or two thousand or three thousand or five thousand years ago. God hates sin. And contrary to popular belief, sometimes God hates the sinner. Sometimes. Read Malachi chapter 1. 
But Bob, my church says that God loves everybody. Well, read Malachi chapter 1. God did not love Esau. Did not love Esau. Sometimes God hates the sinner and his sin. You know, until you understand that how much God hates sin, how can we appreciate his forgiveness? I mean, really, think about it. And his mercy and love. I mean, it's... You know, when Jesus was in the garden alone, knowing that he was getting ready to go to the trial and and be put up on the cross and die. And he was just as human as we were. I mean, what a horrible thought. And he was uh, sweating, as it were, drops of blood. You know, think about that. I mean, I, I just... And, and people think they go to one of these Billy Graham revival things and says a 30 second sinner's prayer and oh you know now you're forgiven you can go live any way you want and do anything you want and you know and people actually believe this stuff i mean it cost it cost christ everything he had on this earth you think about that Now, the uh, fire in the brazen altar was to be burning continually. But, uh, you know, when they burned the sacrifice, let's take a look at Exodus chapter 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, verse 2, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, this is the uh, the Passover, uh, which is spring. You know, it's like March, April. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to him, next to his house, take it according to the number of the souls, Every man according to his eating shall make you count for the lamb. Now remember, uh, John the Baptist, seeing Jesus, said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Christ was a sinless lamb. Uh, this lamb was representative of what was to come. Verse 5, Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper doorpost of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. Uh, remember, Jesus said, well, you know, you had the shedding of blood. You had the eating of the lamb. All right, verse 8. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread. And with bitter herbs shall they eat it. The bitter herbs were a reminder of the bitter bondage that they served with in Egypt, being slaves. The unleavened bread. Well, how do you make leavened, leavened bread? You know, bread rising. Uh, gals understand this stuff. The guys, you gotta, I got to explain it for the guys. You would take, there's basically two types of yeast. You use yeast. There's baker's yeast, which is used for bread to rise. And then there's brewer's yeast, which is used to make alcohol. 
And um, yeast is used improperly is not a good thing. I mean, let's face it, drunkenness is not a good thing in the Bible. But when you would take bread and you would put yeast in it, it would rise. It was leavened. That's that soft stuff, you know, the soft bread. But if you didn't do that, well, then you would have basically like a cracker. Now, the thing is, in the Bible, leaven was always likened unto sin. You could take a holy lump, put some sin in it, and the whole lump would be leavened. So, uh, that's why they always told us, in the Bible, always told us to cast out those that were uh, the sinners until they became repentant and wanted to come back in. Because if you had some people doing wickedness in the church, it would spread. Well, they're doing it, so why can't I? No, you're supposed to cast them out of the congregation. That's how it was. And on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that was the thing. The Lord said, go through your house and throw out all the leaven in the house. Get rid of all the, the yeast in the house. Well, it wasn't so much the yeast. It was supposed to be us taking a spiritual inventory of our lives and saying, okay, I've done some things this year that are not pleasing to the Lord. Identify them and then repent and get rid of them. Cast them out. That was the whole purpose. All right, uh, let's see. Verse 9. So, with the lamb, uh, eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. Um, you know, the Bible plainly teaches, and I did an entire Bible study on fire, that um, fire is for purification. Our works are going to be burned with fire. Our carnal earthly works will be burned up. Our spiritual works will remain. And if you want to do some more research on that, well, take a look at my uh, playlist on fire. But that's the thing. We were supposed to burn the Passover lamb, anything that remained. It was not supposed to lay around and stink. And you know what's interesting? Is Christ, when he died for three days and three nights, went into the heart of the earth. What was in the heart of the earth fire? No, Christ wasn't in the fire if you want to read about something, look up the rich man and Lazarus. And sorry, it's not a parable. But Christ went for three days and three nights into the heart of the earth and preached to the spirits in prison. And I did a Bible study on that too, which is really interesting, I think. You know, all these people that teach soul sleep, eh, no, I don't think so. But there was fire. The rich man was in the flames. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Christ, and all the Old Testament prophets were in a compartment of hell where they were not being punished. So all our works are going to be burned. And those that remain will get a reward for. 
I know I'm covering a lot of material. I'm kind of, if anybody's interested in any specific questions, you can write me and I'll post a comment, no problem. Because um, this is, I could, I could do this for hours. I mean, I could just branch off for hours and hours. And I've covered a lot of this material already. That's why I hate doing covering the same material five or six times. I feel like I'm just repeating myself. So, all right. So, verse 11. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, and against all the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. But, but Bob, that's really cruel that God's going to kill all the firstborn in Egypt. Well, Pharaoh decreed that all the male Hebrew children to be cast into the river, the Nile. I thought that was pretty cruel too. So that they could be snacks for the crocodiles? I don't think so. And all the plagues of Egypt were challenges to the gods of Egypt. Think about that. The, they had a god of frogs, a f god of flies. Beelzebub was the god of the flies. Um, let's see, the, the rivers turned to blood, you know. They had a god of the river. Uh, they had a god of the sky. Um, they had a god of uh, Set, which was the, uh, no, I'm sorry, Ra. Ra was a sun god. Well, guess what? It got dark for three days. Moses said, my god's bigger than your god. And there was darkness in for three days. Um, I did another Bible study on that. Playlist, people. Playlist. You know, I've done a lot of studies over the years. Over the last six or so years. Verse 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood... And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. And I think the Lord's Supper is absolutely the fulfillment of this, the bread and the wine. Matter of fact, let's read that real quick. Luke 22, verse 15. And he said unto them, Jesus, With desire I, Jesus, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after dinner, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. You know, take, eat, this is my body, you know, the bread. Take, drink, this is the blood, my blood, you know. And uh, that Lord's Supper, I believe, replaces the, uh, the Passover, fulfills it, I should say, fulfills it. But uh, I've done a couple Passover dinners before with lamb, roasted lamb, you know. But uh, don't really have anybody to do it with. I hope one day that changes. I don't know if we're going to have 
boy, I don't know if we're going to have uh, much more time. This is uh, almost October 2020. Today's September 29, 2020. I honestly don't think we do have that much time. So, now, um, Christopher Campbell of the uh, revelationscriptures.com website, I kind of... He kind of considers me, well, we kind of consider each other a uh, ministry partner. He made me an, an administrator on his Facebook um, page. You get a lot of weirdos there, but, you know, we're just trying to warn people. But he made a very, very valid point. Uh, if there's anybody that knows the book of Revelation, it's him. You know, I thought I had a decent knowledge of it, but... He just blows me away. Um, he says, you'll know when the when Revelation is starting to be fulfilled and the tribulation, when you see massive reductions in world populations. And he's right on the money with that. He's right on the money. There's going to be a, a quarter of mankind killed, and there's going to be a third of mankind killed. And then, at the uh, very end, there's going to be a, a grand slaughter. But uh, you're talking, when you, when you read about, you know, one, one and a half billion people dead, then you know the plagues of Revelation are coming to pass. But right now, the world population is growing. Now, I don't know if the, um, the evil ones are going to have a hand in being able to fulfill this, those prophecies, but uh, it's very possible that the Lord is going to allow them to um, perform, via their hands, perform the Lord's will. I don't know. Uh, Revelation 9 verse let's go to verse 15 i mean this is pretty pretty heavy stuff and the four angels were loosed which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay for to slay the third part of men verse 16 and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand uh, that's a 200 million man army, people. That's a lot. That's, there's only one country in the history of the world that I know of that could field an army that large. And that's modern day China. The United, uh, the world didn't have that kind of a population that could have supported that large of an army. Matter of fact, skeptics back in times past said, well, there's not even that many people in the whole earth. So the Bible is a bunch of garbage. That's what they would say. Well, guess what? There's about 7.5 billion people on the earth. One in five that lives on this earth is Chinese. And China has over 50% males. Matter of fact, they abort. They're only allowed one child. So when they, um, when they have um, a kid... And it's a female, they get rid of it oftentimes. Not always. But over 50% are males. So you figure 1.5 billion, which is 1,500 million, divide that by 50, that's 750,000, uh, 750 million. And you get rid of everybody under 16 and everybody over 40. You could field an army of 200 million easily. You could do it. Oh, yeah. And it's only uh, 100 years ago we didn't have that kind of population. We couldn't have done it. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of uh, jacinth and brimstone and the heads of the horses were as the 
heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued smoke, uh, issued fire and smoke and brimstone. I wonder if these are uh, iron chariots, like tanks or something. I don't know. Verse 18. By these three were the third part of men killed. By these three were the third part of men killed. By the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. So when you start seeing massive population reductions, deaths, uh, revelations coming true. So, all right, well, uh, I guess this is going to be the end of the uh, brazen altar. We'll get to the next pieces of furniture in the next uh, Bible study. Um, and like I say, if you've got any questions, leave a comment. I'll uh, refer you to one of my previous Bible studies that goes into detail, like fire. I've got a multi-part series on just fire. Everybody thinks, oh, fire's bad. Fire's bad. Um, well, if you're of the wicked, yeah, fire's not going to be good for you. But for the believers, those who are in Christ, it's going to burn up our carnal, earthly, natural works. And if you've got spiritual works, well, they're not going to be burned up. So, um, fire is going to be a good thing. It's going to cleanse and purify the earth. Get rid of all the wicked. Which I'm uh, looking forward to, actually. You know? Let's face it. Fire and brimstone was the salvation of Lot. Yeah. The flood of Noah was the salvation for Noah. And the cross of Christ is the flood, uh, salvation of those that believe. So, all right, well, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. Uh, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.